Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the final changes to the U.S. munitions list and the corresponding commerce control list hosted by SPIE. Due to the large number of participants on today's call, the line will be muted, but we encourage you to submit questions during the webinar using the webinar chat box. Today's presentation will be emailed to all registered participants and posted on the SPI website at spie.org backslash export. Let's get started. Today we have um, our moderator, Jennifer Doris, who is the Government Affairs Director for SPIE and Vice Chair for the Sensors Instrumentation Technical Advisory Committee for the Bureau of Industry and Security at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Jennifer has been leading the SPI effort to engage the technical community in export control reform processes. Jennifer, will you please introduce today's speakers? Thanks, Chrisenda. Today we're joined by Matt Borman, Deputy Assistant Secretary at BIS, which is the Bureau of Industry and Security at the Department of Commerce. We also have Chris Costanzo, Deputy Director for Sensors and Aviation at BIS, Steve Immey, Senior Advisor for Export Administration, and John Barisi, also with the Sensors and Aviation Division. I will now turn it over to Steve Immey, who will begin today's discussion. Steve? Thanks, Jennifer, and welcome everyone to uh, this webinar. Uh, so we are with the Department of Commerce, uh, which published one of the two final rules that revised controls uh, for items related to uh, USML Category 12. Uh, we are going to give an overview of the Export Control Reform Initiative. We'll just touch upon uh, the State Department's final rule and give some uh, thoughts on that and then also finally turn to our corresponding rule to describe some of the changes uh, that will take place uh, as of December uh, 31st. Uh, now, we, again, we are discussing two separate rules, and any guidance that we give t on the State Department's final rule is, of course, just our uh, initial guidance. If you want authoritative uh, guidance on the State Department's rule, we recommend that you discuss that uh, with the State Department's Director of Defense Trade Controls. Uh, so Category 12 is the 18th category in the U.S. missions list to be revised under the President's Export Control Reform Initiative. And this was about five years in the making. Uh, it was a very difficult category, uh, required a lot of work among many employees of various agencies, commerce, state and defense primarily, and also required a lot of input from the public. Uh, no other USML category received as many public comments as Category 12. So all the work that uh, you put into reviewing uh, the first two sets proposed rules and uh, were instrumental in getting to this point uh, today to have uh, two final rules published last month. So uh, again, thank you very much for all of your time and attention uh, throughout this process. We certainly appreciate it. Now, just by way of background, uh, for those of you who are less familiar with export controls and the Export Control Reform Initiative, uh, the work we have done has primarily focused on two sets of regulations, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, also known as the ITAR, and then the Commerce Department's Export Administration regula Regulations, known as the EAR. Uh, generally, the ITAR controls items, uh, defense articles and defense services on its U.S. munitions list, and the Commerce Department historically covered mostly dual use and commercial items controlled on its commerce control list as well as non-specified items. But under the Export Reform Initiative, uh, tens of thousands of less sensitive uh, items, military items, primarily parts components, have moved from the State Department's jurisdiction to the Commerce Department's jurisdiction. So that has taken the bulk of our time uh, under uh, Export Reform Initiative. So these first couple slides trying to break down the differences between the ITAR and the EAR. And under the ITAR, you'll see that um, uh, it is broad in scope and has uh, wide-ranging and far-reaching license requirements, uh, whereas the Export Administration Regulations is more tailored uh, to the sensitivity of the item, the destination it's going to, as well as the end use and the end user. So uh, again, the ITAR primarily focuses on uh, those most sensitive military items, whereas the EAR under the Commerce Department uh, has more tailored controls for items ranging from less sensitive military items to dual use and commercial items. Now, under the Export Reform Initiative, uh, again, this started back in 2009, uh, President Obama directed the agencies to do 
a uh, broad-based review of the export, export control system. And uh, based on that, there were three key objectives uh, on the next slide uh, to enhance national security. Uh, the administration wanted to make sure that we could improve ways in which the U.S. could increase interoperability with NATO and other close allies, reduce incentives for companies overseas to avoid or design out U.S. origin content, and then finally to allow the U.S. government to focus its resources on those transactions of greater concern. So uh, by using the more tailored controls of the Commerce Department, where we have uh, uh, minimum provisions, and uh, again, we can tailor our license requirements and have more availability of license exceptions. Uh, using that system, we've worked to meet these three main goals of the reform efforts. Uh, now the next slide uh, gives you just sort of an overview of the framework uh, involved in the process. Uh, essentially, again, the main work has been to move less sensitive military items as well as uh, commercial satellite items from the U.S. munitions list to uh, the commerce control list and then uh, work to utilize the benefits of the uh, system of the Commerce Department by using, for example, uh, license exceptions, strategic trade authorization, or STA, uh, to facilitate uh, trade uh, by and among uh, close U.S. allies uh, for many of these items that have moved over. So that's a very, very basic uh, and quick overview of the reform efforts. Uh, our website has a lot more details on that as well as slides and brochures if you're interested uh, to find out more details. Now, for USML Category 12 specifically, uh, again, it's been a long process. Uh, two uh, proposed rules we started in May 2015 uh, based on public comments uh, that found that a lot of the State Department's proposal captured items of normal commercial use. We published a second set of proposed rules in February of 2016. Uh, and then based on public comments we received on that rule, the State Department and the Commerce Department published final rules on October 12th of this year. Now, these rules have an effective date of December 31st, which is a shortened, effect, I guess a shortened transition period between the publication date and the effective date. So uh, we certainly encourage you to review the changes um, and see whether their changes are being made to the jurisdiction of your items. And then if you have any questions, certainly please feel free to contact us. And we have contact information at the end of this presentation. So use about Category 12, uh, as published in October, uh, covers fire control, laser, imaging, and guidance equipment. It's broken down uh, essentially into uh, six paragraphs, uh, A, B, and C, uh, and D primarily focus on systems or end items. And then paragraph E applies to parts, components, accessories, or attachments, often specially designed for the items uh, described before it. And then paragraph F describes technical data and defense services, essentially those uh, that technical data directly related uh, to those items that are described in USML Category 12. Now, the next slide discusses some of the high-level changes uh, to Category 12. Uh, one of the most important high-level changes was the use of specially designed as the uh, as a main uh, uh, control parameter for entries on USML Category 12. Uh, we attempted in the first proposed rule to use a lot of specifications, performance parameters to make it more easy to identify what items we intend to capture in the USML. But again, uh, based on public comments, we found that a lot of the parameters used ended up capturing items in normal commercial use. And therefore, I received a lot of comments that using specially designed would be the best way to identify those items that weren't controlled on the US munitions list. So you will see uh, many entries in Category 12 that do use specially designed. Now, there are some entries that use a specific terminology called special design for a military end user, which is a new concept that was introduced in the second proposed rule. Uh, we'll discuss uh, how that concept works in a few slides, uh, but it's somewhat different than the normal uh, usage of special design in most other entries on the USML. Now, another change was to kind of separate out uh, those end items and systems from parts and components special design for those end items and systems within the structure of Category 12. So uh, A, B, C, and D again focus on primarily end items and systems. And then E focuses on the parts, components, accessories, and attachments specially designed for items in A through D. Now the current legacy Category 12 does include language uh, that carves out uh, what's informally known as the see-through rule under Categories 12C and 12E. Uh, the see-through rule essentially means that um, 
if any non-U.S. origin item incorporates any amount of U.S. origin ITAR content, then that foreign origin item will become essentially subject to the ITAR and will require a retransfer authorization from the State Department in addition to any uh, local uh, requirements where that foreign made item is located. Uh, so uh, one of the benefits of the Commerce system is the use of de minimis provisions, which uh, allows for uh, non-U.S. made items to incorporate a certain amount of U.S. controlled content without becoming subject to our regulations. And because we hope that we were able to delineate those items and normal commercial use from those truly military items, uh, the thought was the, uh, the current text in 12C and 12V is no longer needed. And so uh, by virtue of hopefully making that distinction uh, more apparent and clear, uh, we hope that um, that language, uh, we remove that language and hope that will work out in this situation. And then one of the key goals again was to increase clarity on jurisdiction. And by increasing clarity and jurisdiction for the uh, commodities subject to the ITAR, uh, we believe that uh, the same clarity will apply to that technology and software uh, as well. So again, Category 12 will follow the, the normal process of other categories under the U.S. emissions list, and that technology and software jurisdiction will follow the commodity. And so if the uh, commodity is subject to the EAR, then uh, technology and software uh, for that should be also controlled under the EAR. So that's a, a brief high-level overview of U.S. Model Category 12. We're now going to go into more details on some of those aspects. Uh, and before we do that, I'm going to start with the definition of specially designed. Uh, specially designed is a control parameter that's been used extensively uh, throughout both the State Department and the Commerce Department control list. Uh, before the reform effort, State actually used the terminology specifically designed, modified, adapted, or configured. And uh, when we revised those categories, we use specially designed in that place. And now we have a definition of that term under both the State Department regulations and the Commerce Department regulations. I want to go over very briefly on the State Department side uh, to give you background on how uh, specially designed normally works. Uh, now, state's definition for it is in at least section 20.41 of the ITAR. And uh, these next two slides give you just a brief overview of that concept. Essentially, it was easier to define what was not specially designed than to define what was specially designed. So the structure of the definition has what we call a catch and release structure. Uh, paragraph A of the definition is the catch, and paragraph B is the release. Now, under the, the catch in paragraph A, it's split into two. There's A1 and A2. And A1 will catch any item whether it's an end item, a material, software, uh, a part component, accessory attachment, that as a result of development has properties peculiarly responsible for achieving or exceeding performance levels, characteristics, or functions in the relevant USML paragraph. So essentially that means that uh, in any of the stages prior to serial production of the item, whether it's in, during the design phase, the testing phase of, of prototypes, um, during that time, during development, uh, one basically would have to take steps to meet whatever the performance level or characteristic is that's in the control parameter. Uh, so A1 is can be a broad catch, but is not as broad as, say, a capable of standard catch. So just because something is capable of doing something does not mean it was specially designed to do that something. Uh, so again, one has to take steps as a result of development to meet that uh, specific uh, characteristic or function. Paragraph A2 applies only to parts, components, accessories, or attachments, but it is a very broad catch. It does not matter what steps were taken during development, so long as any part, component, accessory, attachment is used in or with a defense article. It doesn't matter what the intent was. If it, is, if it finds its way into a defense article, into a military item, then it is caught by A2. So A2 is a much broader catch than A1. Now, because of the broad catch of A2 for parts, components, accessories, and attachments, we added paragraph B releases for those same uh, types of items. And under the ITAR, there are five releases, uh, B1 through B5. Uh, again, these releases do not apply to end items or materials, so uh, paragraph A1 is the only analysis for those types of items. Uh, but under paragraph B, you have B1, which uh, essentially means that if an item uh, was found in a commodity jurisdiction to be subject to the ITAR, then it is. If it wasn't, if it's a 
concept of the EAR, then uh, it's released under B1. Uh, B2 applies only to specific types of parts and some components, uh, primarily if they are fasteners. So uh, the type of item has to be listed in paragraph B2 to qualify for the B2 uh, release. B3 is probably the most uh, important release in paragraph B. Uh, essentially, uh, if the item has the same function, performance cap capabilities, and the same or equivalent form or fit uh, as an uncontrolled item, uh, as, sorry, as an item used in, an, in a non-defense article that's in production, then you can qualify for B3. Uh, B3 uh, is not, I would say, as objective as B1 and B2. It's you know, mostly objective, but again, uh, it's, well, I would say it actually is uh, objective, but uh, determining if something is equivalent can be to require a lot of analysis uh, in the process. So that does, does make B3 uh, one of the more difficult releases to, to analyze. B4 and B5 are, are more subjective in that they allow for uh, intent into the analysis, but it has to be done during developmental phase. So uh, if an item was being developed for use in or with items on the USML for items not on the USML, uh, then B4 can apply so long as uh, the company has contemporaneous documentation during the development phase. For paragraph B5, if it's a general purpose commodity of software, so it was not uh, designed for a particular commodity or type of commodity, uh, then again B5 would apply so long as one has that, that uh, contemporaneous documentation during development. So that is a, a brief uh, description of specially designed. We have a, I think a whole seminar on specially designed, a whole presentation on specially designed, so uh, if you have additional questions, please go to our website. Uh, we also have decision tree tools that can help you analyze the definition to your uh, specific products uh, as well. So turn to the next slide, uh, specially designed for military end user. Now, as I said before, there are many entries in CAT 12 that do use specially designed as a control parameter, but they often will say uh, certain items specially designed for uh, essentially a defense article, so designed for something else on the U.S. munitions list. There were a certain type of universe of items where we could not use that normal construct, especially design. There were some items uh, we found that could be used as an end item uh, as well as a component. Uh, and because of that, uh, it was difficult to use the normal framework for specially design, so we had to come up with something different. And that something different was specially designed for a military end user. Now, this only applies to uh, a certain number of entries in Category 12. So you do not apply this standard unless it actually says special design for military end user. And this slide uh, gives you the entries in Category 12, uh, which it does apply to. Now, to, to get guidance on how to apply the standard, you look to the note to Category 12. And also, the preamble to the State Department's rule uh, in replying to public comments on this gives a good overview of the process to follow. So uh, this slide attempts to, to distill both that note and the uh, language in the State Department's preamble to describe how to do it. Uh, essentially, uh, what you would do is you apply uh, the catch in paragraph A1 uh, to the def definition of military end user uh, that's found in note to category 12. And there are two releases that are available uh, for special design for military end user. They're essentially similar to B4 and B5, but, but somewhat modified. So if the item was developed for use by both military and non-military end users, then it's released from this concept. Also, if the item is developed for no specific end user, then it is also released from that construct. But again, like B4 and B5, one must have contemporaneous documentation of the design intent in order to take advantage of those two releases. Now, if you do not have such documentation and uh, you find that your item was originally developed for a military end user, but since then it's transitioned into normal commercial use, you do have the option to submit a commodity jurisdiction request to the State Department to determine if the item should remain on the USML. So this is a, an attempt to address some of the concerns in the public comments uh, about applying this standard because there were concerns that it is a very strict standard to apply, and it's, in essence it, it is. Uh, now this is you know, a concept that sometimes is described as the least worst alternative. Um, the agencies cannot find a better way to address uh, controlling these types of items using special design. Uh, so we will be going out for comments on this issue in a subsequent notice of inquiry uh, 
among other issues as well. So again, we do ask um, certainly for your thoughts on the concepts and uh, for the forthcoming NOI, which we'll discuss uh, a little bit later as well. Now the next slide talks about uh, certain entries in Category 12 that control items based on whether they received uh, funding for, for the development by the, the Department of Defense. Uh, so these entries do not use special designs. They do not use you know, specific control parameters. It's entirely based on whether uh, an item in development received any amount of funding from the Department of Defense. And <clears throat> I believe there are four entries in Category 12 uh, that do use this uh, DOD developmental control uh, uh, for them. Now it's important to note that these entries do not control items in production. If your items in production, then this does not apply. You would certainly look to other entries in Category 12 to see if that would apply, but uh, these would not. Uh, also, if your item was determined to be subject to the EAR via CJ, then of course these entries do not apply as well. And perhaps most importantly, if the item was identified in the relevant DOD contract or other funding authorization as being developed for both civil and military applications, uh, then these entries uh, would not apply as well. And it's important to note that using this concept, it doesn't mean that um, when you talk to your contracting officer, try to get this language inserted, it doesn't mean that you're asking the contracting officer uh, to make a export control jurisdictional determination. All you would be asking them is to you know, essentially recognize whether uh, the item is being developed for both civil and military applications, and that's it. If that's the case, then if you have that in your contract, then these development controls would not apply. Uh, finally, these general entries do not apply to contracts dated before October 12, 2017. So essentially, there's a, um, <clears throat> a grandfathering period of sorts uh, before these entries uh, on the USML would go into effect. So that is a um, high-level overview of some of the uh, changes to Category 12 on the State Department side. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to either Chris Costanzo or John Verici to go through some of the specific entries in Category 12 uh, from a technical perspective and, and describe some of the controls therein. Uh, thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, the next few slides uh, are really just kind of uh, serve as examples to um, what the, the new ITAR in Category 12 looks like, and perhaps some uh, just some relevant uh, cases where where we've seen cases uh, uh, in either commodity jurisdictions or licensing arise. So, and, and so, um, you know, as mentioned before, the ITAR is divided up in Category 12 into paragraphs A, B, C, D, E, and F. And in A, we have fire control aiming detection guidance and tracking system as follows. And much of this language is kind of a holdover from the earlier uh, ITAR. Um, but you should note that under 3, there's, a, 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 an, a, there's a, an exception that says our controls on LIDAR see paragraph B6 of this category, of course. Um, one of the biggest applications we see these days coming up is in um, uh, automotive LIDAR systems. And so um, we, we absolutely don't want to capture those. And so we hope that uh, some of this exclusion will work there. But I don't think anybody would have any, any, uh, any concerns about bomb sites or uh, you know, systems that uh, can identify, automatically detect, locate, ordnance, launch, blast, or fire being captured on the on the USML. I mean, and so in terms of a bright line, I think uh, uh, you know, A does a good job of of saying what people would normally think or companies would normally think. If I'm making a missile or ordnance electro optical tracking system, then that by all means should be on the USML, just like if I were making a fire control system, it should be. So I, I'm going to uh, continue on with uh, with uh, uh, paragraph C, which talks about imaging systems or end items as follows. And um, you know, perhaps this is an area where we've had a lot more confusion and resulting in a number of commodity jurisdiction requests being submitted. Um, and so in this category, you see uh, binoculars, bioculars, monoculars. Um, uh, where there are a number of 
commercial applications and, and products in that space. But it's been qualified now as saying if it has it has to employ either an auto-gated third gen image intensifier tube or higher generation image intensifier tube, leaving out generation two ones. Um, Fusing an output image intensifier tube or an infrared focal plane ray having a peak response in the wavelength greater than 1,000 nanometers. So if you're doing fusion um, along with, you know, between an image intensifier tube and an infrared focal plane ray, that's a little more sophisticated. We don't really see that in the commercial space so much. So uh, we think that would be a good uh, a cut in terms of what is and isn't on the munitions list. And then we have the uh, third uh, uh, element of the uh, of what could be used in a binocular, biocular, monocular, etc., um, which would be having an infrared focal plane array or imaging camera, and being specially designed for military end user. And as Steve uh, mentioned earlier, specially designed is very important. There, if something's in production, for instance, or if it was originally conceived to be a civil or dual use item, then then uh, certainly that item would be civil, uh, even if the focal plane rate was 1,024 by 1,024 uh, or uh, had a generation two, uh, or, or basically if it, if it had a 30 hertz frame rate or 9 hertz frame rate. Um, of course, perhaps weapon sites uh, might be a little more uh, of a, a carryover from before where if you do have a thermal imaging weapon site that can withstand a weapon shock or recoil um, and incorporates an infrared focal plane ray, that would find itself still on the USML. Um, so, uh, and we see those kind of articles in, in, um, in, uh, routinely here or, or in the past. We've seen that as topics of commodity jurisdictions. Um, perhaps the last and more significant uh, category or paragraph that uh, has changed is under paragraph E, and uh, parts, components, accessories, or attachments. And uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps um, one of the highlights here is night vision infrared cameras cores, specially designed for articles in this subchapter. In the past, there's been a lot of discussion about camera cores and their uh, relative uh, potential would be on the USML. Um, this clarifies that, in fact, that that's not the case unless they're specially designed for some article in the subchapter. Another significant change is that in the past, people believed that focal plane arrays, infrared focal plane arrays, were all on the USML. Uh, bullet number five. Uh, clearly states that they have to be specially designed for articles in the subchapter. Um, and in, in bullet six, there are some uh, technical parameters included here, but they're also combined with, again, the specially designed uh, for art articles described in the subchapter, which uh, should release a number of EMCCDs type of focal plane arrays. And finally, in uh, seven, uh, in seven, um, we have second generation and greater image intensifier tubes specially designed for articles in the subchapter and their parts and components. And so in the past, even a high generation or high per, uh, uh, performance second gen tubes were captured because of a figure of merit. Here, basically, only those that are specially designed for articles in the subchapter would find themselves caught. So again, that's quite a step forward in, in terms of how we would be able to describe uh, what is and isn't on the ITAR in terms of components. Um, if we go on, um, uh, we can see in uh, uh, bullet number 13 that optical sensors having a, a, a spectral filter specially designed for systems or equipment on the USML um, are captured on 11 in category 11, A4. We don't see too much work there. But in 14, we do have ROIC specially designed for articles in the subchapter. So again, if you have a ROIC that's uh, designed for a focal plane array, but it's a dual-use focal plane array, it wouldn't be caught there. 
it would have to be applied to uh, a special focal plane array that's designed specifically for the military, or rather for articles in the subchapter. Uh, another area where we uh, find ourselves sometimes uh, uh, in a commodity jurisdiction escalations involve integrated cooler doer assemblies. Um, so they're all um, would be captured on the ITAR if they're designed, again, specially for articles in the subchapter. And that it means with or without a focal plane array as well. So in this case, if it's used in civil and military applications and was designed for such, then that would be on this commerce control list. And again, it propagates to a number of other topics as well. Gimbals, infrared focal plane, self-regulated cryostats, and infrared lenses, mirrors, beam slitters, all of those kind of items are, again, going to be, uh, have to be specially designed in order to be captured on the USML. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Steve Emmy, who can, or, or um, Steve Emmy, who can comment on uh, the next couple of slides. All right, thanks, Chris. So now we're going to turn to the uh, commerce final rule and describe the changes that will uh, go into effect uh, on December 31st of this year. And a lot of the uh, Commerce Department final rule focused on making changes to controls uh, for items that have infrared detection capability. And the majority of the changes focus on items controlled uh, under uh, four main uh, ECCNs, or Export Control Classification Numbers. Those are 6A002, 6A003, 6A990, and 6A993.A. Um, we essentially focused on concerns regarding uh, the military application of such items, uh, primarily at the uh, component level. And as a result of that, we uh, either expanded controls or uh, tightened them to some degree uh, to, to gain additional visibility into certain transactions uh, and uh, include additional license requirements. So uh, for 6A002 optical sensors, we did remove uh, license exception eligibility for all items in that ECCN. Uh, for use with STA, the Strategic Trade Authorization License Exception, as well as APR, which is additional permissive re-exports. Uh, we also added uh, 6A002 to the scope of um, uh, controls pertaining to 744.9 and 08919, which I'll get, get into in a few slides. Uh, 6A003 cameras, uh, we uh, made sure that uh, such items were ineligible for paragraph B of um, uh, sorry, uh, paragraph A of uh, APR, uh, while some items remain eligible in paragraph B of, of that license exception. Uh, and unlike the second proposed rule, there are no changes to 6A003 for the reasons for control uh, to that uh, ECCN as well as to the authorizations related to certain uncooled thermal imaging cameras uh, described in section 742.6. Uh, 6A990 currently controls a specific type of readout integrated circuit or ROIC. Uh, the final rule will expand the scope of that UCCN to control uh, all ROIC specially designed for an FPA described in 6A002.8.3, uh, but we did add a new civil automotive carve-out uh, uh, to that uh, UCCN, uh, and that also carve-out applies to really software and technology. Uh, we did remove the use of STA and APR for ROICs, uh, but we did uh, throw in a new license exception, uh, LVS for limited value shipments, uh, but that only applies to uh, shipments of the value of $500 or less. Uh, we also added 6A980 to, again, 744.9 and 08919, which we'll get into in a minute, and then did the same for 9 hertz cameras and 68993.A. Now, on the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about some of the changes to software and technology for such items. Uh, we attempted to reduce any potential gaps in software technology related to those commodities that we described. Uh, so the changes in this slide actually go further than existing multilateral controls on such items. Uh, we revised our existing 6D991 to expand it to include software uh, not elsewhere specified uh, for the development, production, or use of 6A002, 6A003, uh, or 6A990 items in addition to other software controlled in that entry. 
And then we can create a new ECCN 0E987, which applies to technology required for development or production of commodities control. In 0E987, that incorporates a focal point array or an image intensifier too. So as a new ECCN, that will go into effect uh, at the end of the year. On the next slide, uh, as with commodities, we also tightened uh, the use of license exceptions for uh, related software and technology. So we added a new uh, entry into uh, Section 740.2 to restrict the use of any license exception, uh, except for uh, certain parts of GOV that would apply to the U.S. government. Uh, for uh, certain production or development technology, uh, for certain photon detector, microblower detector, pyroelectric or multi-spectral detector, infrared focal plane arrays, or for third gen uh, or greater image intensifier tubes. We re removed uh, STA eligibility for uh, you know, the new 0E987, uh, and then the uh, software controls related to uh, items in 6A002, 6A003, or 6A990. And then finally, we restrict the availability of license exception TSR, which applies to certain uh, transactions involving technology or software, uh, again, for those previously described ECCNs. Uh, but we did allow TSR for certain uh, integration technology for civil automotive applications uh, under 6E001 and 6E002, so a very uh, small uh, universe of uh, technology in those ECCNs would be eligible for TSR. Now the next slide uh, goes into license requirements pertaining to 744.9 and 08919. And uh, 744.9 essentially imposes a license requirement uh, for certain items when one knows that they will be used by a military end user or incorporated into a military commodity described in 08919. Now on the dual use side, currently it applies only to certain types of cameras in 6A003. The final rule expands that scope uh, to include all cameras in 6A003, as well as uh, items in 0A987 that incorporate, uh, again, some of the um, uh, items in 6A2, 6A3, 6A980, or 9 years cameras in 6A983.A. Also expanded to include if it incorporates uh, any rogues in 6A990. Uh, 900 cameras in 6A993.A or to underwater camera systems in 8A002.D. So this is an expansion of the current controls uh, that are in place in 744.9. Now 0919 is the ECCN that applies to military commodities located and produced outside the U.S. that incorporate certain U.S. content. Again, on the dual use side, 0919 only applies to uh, U.S. content uh, that involves certain uh, cameras in 6A003. We will expand that as of the end of the year uh, to include uh, U.S. origin uh, 6A002 items, any camera in 6A003, as well as items 6A990 or 9 hertz cameras in 6A983.A. On a related note, we did revise the de minimis application uh, to uh, four main items that are classified under 0A919. Uh, we harmonized it with the existing uh, uh, standard if such 0 and 919 items incorporate 600 series content. So essentially if the infrared detection content uh, is uh, over 25% uh, um, so, uh, then it will be caught but uh, the, there's a 0% standard if it's going to country group D5 and there is a 25% standard for all uh, other destinations. So again it's a way to harmonize uh, the defense provisions with respect to 0 and 919. Uh, also on the Jewish side, we uh, revised uh, uh, our license application review policy. So if items uh, described in uh, 6E001 or 6E002 or 6990 uh, are desperate for D5 in the license application, they will, will be reviewed with a presumption of denial. Um, also another harmonization change on our side, we removed all controls specific to certain uh, QRS-11 sensors. This includes uh, provisions on the minimus in 734, also provisions on the use of license exceptions in Part 740. So all provisions that are specific to the QRS-11 sensors, core trait sensors, will be taken out uh, as of December 31st. Now lastly, on our rule, uh, we did create a 600 series uh, control entries uh, like all other uh, corresponding uh, bookend rules that we have under the reform efforts. Uh, for category 12, the corresponding entries are in the 7X 611 ECCNs. Uh, we anticipate there will be a small number of military items that will move 
from Category 12, uh, primarily because the catch-all control that exists today in 12E will be taken out from 12E and will essentially move to 786.11.x. Uh, however, uh, certain dual-use uh, controls will trump uh, the use of 786.11.x. Uh, so uh, this applies uh, to certain uh, accelerometers, gyros, uh, inertial measurement equipment, or other systems. Um, so essentially, if the military item in question is not on US-1 Category 12 or elsewhere on the USML, and it is specially designed uh, for a defense article or 600 series item, uh, but if it meets the parameters in those specific dual-use ECCNs on, uh, that are listed in that slide, then they will be controlled by that dual-use ECCN. If they do not meet those parameters, then they will be controlled under 7A611.X. And we did that. Uh, we altered the normal order of review due to issues uh, with the use of specially designed and the paragraph B3 release. Uh, finally, all items uh, that do move to uh, 7X611 will be eligible for uh, the strategic trade authorization uh, license exception. So that is an uh, overview of uh, the Commerce Department final rules, part of uh, the Category 12 changes. I'm now going to turn it over to our Deputy Assistant Secretary, Matt Borman, uh, who will describe uh, essentially the next steps uh, in the process, which applies to a forthcoming notice of inquiry. Thank you, Steve, and um, thank you to SBIE for putting on the webinar. Um, before I talk about a little bit about the notice of inquiry, I wanted to underscore something that I think was uh, evident in, both, in John, Chris, and Steve's comments. Um, we think we have finally, after many years of effort, have, have done a pretty good job of, of establishing a clear, bright line between things that are truly military in this space and therefore belong on the USML and things that really are, are dual use and commercial and therefore should, uh, if, if needed, be controlled under on the commerce control list. So even though, as Steve mentioned, we have a 600 series entry, that's my, mainly because when we have technical parameters in the USML, at least by definition, anything below those are not USML, but if, if they exist at all, they should be treated as military items, just lower performance. But that's distinct from the, the standard dual-use commercial cameras and components. Um, because there had been so much uh, differing views among the agencies and between the government and industry on, on things like whether infrared focal plane arrays were on the USML or not, um, we agreed in the process to do some tightening on the CCL um, to accommodate some concerns that particularly on the parts, components, core space, we, we, the U.S. government, wanted to have enough visibility so that if they were going into a foreign-made military item, we had a, a visibility to that initial export as well as the re-export of the foreign-made military item. So that's why, in particular, we expanded the scope of 744.9 and, and ECCN 08919. So turning now to the notice of inquiry, <clears throat> because the goal of export control reform is to have a technical or objective control parameters for all of the USML entries, and we were unable to do that in all cases for USML Category 12. As you heard, we, we, and you know, we still have specially designed either for a defense article or for a military user as control parameters in a handful of USML subparagraphs. We will likely, by sort of towards the end of this year or maybe early 17, put out two notices of inquiry, one on the USML will be a series of technical uh, control parameters that would replace the handful of specially designed control entries that are in the USML Category 12 that will become final at the end of the year. And then on the Commerce side, um, some potential changes to uh, the, the, the Commerce controls. These are notices of inquiry and they follow the pattern we've used for other USML categories. We're just doing them much sooner than we have done so far with the other USML categories. The other categories we've done typically a year and a half to two years after the first revision became final. Obviously, we're doing these much sooner. Um, but the, the rationale really is that um, we would like to try to uh, reduce or eliminate the use of the, of the term specially designed as a control parameter in the USML. And so um, the folks, particularly the Department of Defense, have been working on some potential um, 
control parameters to replace those specially designed entries. It's very important, though, that everyone in the industry space look very carefully at those and provide feedback to the government, respond to the notice of inquiry, if <coughs> those parameters either capture something that's currently in, 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 in normal commercial slash civilian use, which would include research use, or is clearly on a roadmap to be commercialized or, 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 or moved to production uh, in the next uh, you know, year to two. That is, they, you can clearly show it's on a, on a technology roadmap. Um, because what we don't want to have is a situation where things are not in normal commercial use today, but um, they, will be, they will be so six months from now, nine months from now, 12 months from now. Um, so it's very important to, um, to look carefully at those and, and give us specific information, again, on, as to whether these parameters that will be in the notice of inquiry for USML Category 12, um, again, either catch things that are in normal commercial use in the United States or it's outside of the United States, or even if not today, they are clearly on a, on a, on a technology roadmap to be, be there again, six months, nine months, 12 months, 15 months from now. And then similarly, on, on the commerce side, certainly comment on any of the potential changes identified to the CCL and the EAR uh, identified in the Commerce Notice of Inquiry. And also, I would say, uh, you are not limited to, in responding to the Notice of Inquiry, to commenting on what's in the NOI if there are other aspects of the commerce or the state rule that now that you have to implement them, uh, you think uh, present issues that weren't bringing to the government's attention, you should do so. It won't necessarily mean there'll be an immediate change, but then you'll be on record early on in the process of uh, speaking to potential other changes when we actually get to the point of doing proposed rules. So again, the sequencing here is notice of inquiry, public comment. Once the public comments are digested, um, if the government thinks any changes are warranted, uh, then we'll go to the proposed rule stage, which is what we did before. So there'll be a second second chance for public comment. I would say realistically, the earliest you'd have any proposed rules to revise the Category 12 and CCL that will become final at the end of this year would be uh, middle of 17 at the earliest and probably even later in, in 2017. But part of the issue here is we want for all these categories to keep them live. We don't want to just do one set of parameters and let them sit and become stale. We need to keep revising them on a periodic basis. So, so your continued input will be very important. Um, I think with that, those are all the slides we want to go over. Um, I, I see we've got a resources slide for you all to um, contact us. And then, um, then I guess we're ready for questions, or is Jennifer going to? Yeah, I, I'll just jump in real quick. First of all, thank you, Matt, for all your work and the team at BIS on these rules. I know it was not an easy road, but the community, I think, really appreciates uh, your dedication to this issue and seeing it through to a positive end um, with these final regulations that have come out. Um, and then I also wanted to take the opportunity to highlight the fact that STIE in conjunction with um, SciTAC, which is the Censures and Instrumentation Technical Advisory Committee, are launching um, working groups um, in three different areas, as you can see on your screen, detectors and cameras, lasers, and lenses. Um, and these groups will be responsible for identifying areas within the export con uh, control system where industry and universities would still like to see some improvements and develop proposals for suggested changes that would be submitted through SciTAC to the department. Um, you don't need to be a member of SciTAC in order to participate in these groups. You can find at the link at the bottom of the page, spie.org backslash export. Um, there's uh, links to be able to register for the different groups. Um, the goal of these groups would be to kind of continue on this progress um, that's been seen in the ECR initiative. Um, now that that is coming to a close with this administration. And yeah, the first I, meetings, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to, I'd really like to underscore the importance of these working groups um, because basically for, I don't know, a decade or more almost, this space has been kind of frozen because of the ongoing differing views, uh, particularly on, um, on uncooled uh, cameras, but, but 
that that's really taken up so much space, both in the government and industry, in terms of regulations. That now that we finally have, I think, a pretty good sort of that, this space can be much more like other technology spaces where the tax are on a pretty regular basis, keeping us in the government informed of technological developments, what's happening in foreign markets, and 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 then as you can see from the slide, not not you know predominantly focused just on uncooled cameras, but the the cool cameras, you know, the composer, the components, the lasers, and all the other uh, technology sectors that are that are covered by this. So so I really want to encourage everyone to participate in the working groups that, that Jennifer is setting up. Thanks, Matt. Um, we're also we're planning on having the first meeting of these groups um, at SPIE Photonics West in San Francisco um, on February 2nd. Um, and you can see on the screen, those are the times for um, the different three groups. So um, if you are registered for the working group, you'll receive the formal invitation to attend these meetings, of course, room information and call-in information. So I do hope that people um, within the community respond and um, participate and continue to approve our export control system. And with that, I think we have time for a few questions. Just a reminder um, that you can submit questions using the webinar text box. Um, and with that, we'll go to the first question. Um, the first question is, will there definitely be some changes made to category 12 and 2017 following this NOI, or is it possible that regulations will remain the same? It's certainly possible that regulations will remain the same. Um, you know, it really will depend on uh, the input we get from the public on the notices of inquiry. But, but as I said, we would like to get to a place where we don't have specially designed as a control parameter in any of the U.S. ML subcategories, but whether we can get there with parameters that don't catch things in normal control. Great. I do have another. Oh. Sorry, uh -huh. I, I just follow by that. Um, I think if there are changes, it's most likely to be on the provisions that are currently specially designed. I, I don't. I think it's less likely you're going to get changes to other technical parameters, but I wouldn't rule that out. If again, comments come in with really substantive information showing that a, tech, a current technical parameter catches things in normal commercial use. Sorry. Thanks. For B3 release, does the original design intent take preference, e.g., what came first? The item may have been in production for military applications long before it was used in civil applications. Well, let me give an answer then and then see if Chris, John, or uh, Steve have a different view. Um, the, the B3 is really, if, it, if, it's, um, if, it's in, if it's used in both military and it's the B4 and the B5 where you have the design intent that matters. So I think B3 is, is really intended to cover those situations. Something was originally designed for and, and even used in military systems, but over time has also ended up being used. That's, that's exactly what the B3 carve out is for. That's Great. Does anyone have anything else to add to that? John, Just, uh, that's remember that, that that concept is in the standard definition of specially designed, where it's specially designed for military end user is just a bit different. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't have that, that same um, release. And uh, just refer back to the slides to, um, to explain that in more detail. It's probably the most efficient way to explain that. Well, so the difference is specially designed for defense article versus military, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, so what I, what I said applies if the control is specially designed for a defense article, that's sort of standard specially designed, if you will. John was pointing out that if it's especially designed for military and user, it's a little bit different because the B3 doesn't, doesn't apply. Great. Um, our next question, um, for current DSP-73 that are used today for cryocooler, should we continue to use that until December 31st? Yes. Yeah, because the 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 kind of the changes don't become effective until the thirty first. So yeah, if you're shipping between Great. now and cite that as your authority. And I think we'll squeeze in one more question here. Does a subcontractor need to try and reopen the main contract with DOD to include that the developmental research we are subcontracting on is for dual use purpose, or is it enough 
to just include the, this language in the contract between ourselves and the prime. <laughs> That's a good question. You guys want to? Can I have you uh, next to the speaker for that answer? Thanks. Yeah, the, uh, the grandfather period will make that question for current contracts obsolete at least. Now for future contracts after I believe October 12, 2017, that's where the issue I think comes into play. And I don't know if we've encountered that. Yeah, although off the top of my head I think it would really have to be in the, in the, in the prime contract because otherwise it would be an odd situation where two private parties you know, who are using DOD money could between themselves say, oh this is for dual use therefore not covered by the development. I think that you'd have to have some, somewhere there'd have to be a, a contract or a document between a party, a private party and DOD saying that. Great. Well, it looks like we're out of time, so this will conclude our webinar for today. I would again like to thank our speakers, Jennifer Duras, Matt Borman, Chris Cassandra, Steve Emmy, and John Versees for from the Bureau of Industry um, and Security and the Department of Commerce. Today's slides will be emailed to all registered participants and posted on SPI's website at spy.org backslash export. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.